Welcome to Field Notes, a storytelling event about local farms and local food. Hello, my name is Phil Corman, and I'm the Executive Director of CESA, Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. For over 25 years, we've been strengthening farms and ensuring that the local food economy is centering communities. And this work continues throughout time because of the involvement of our community. Our vision of a local food economy is one that is resilient, just, and equitable. And part of that vision includes viable farms, it includes respect for the environment, working in fair conditions for everybody who's on the farm, and also local food that is accessible to all. We started Field Notes a few years back, and last year we had to take a bye with it because of the pandemic. But this year, we brought it back to you for the simple reason that, as people, as humans, storytelling is in our DNA. We tell stories to create meaning, frame our reality, share our hopes and dreams. And at CISA, we hear these stories, and we felt, despite the odds, we had to bring you Field Notes this year. I am so glad we are back in the Academy of Music, a treasure in downtown Northampton as our home for Field Notes. And I'm so appreciative of the staff of the Academy for ensuring that we're bringing you this event as safely as we can. We could not do this event without the financial support of so many business sponsors who have been with us for years and years. And a special shout out to River Valley Co-op who every day invests in our mission by ensuring there is space on the shelves for the harvest of our local farms. And thank you to all of you for being with us. When we started Field Notes those few years back, we were thinking, who would it make sense to have as our MC? Well, every week for nearly 10 years, we've been bringing stories from the field in radio interviews, almost 500 radio interviews that I've teamed up with Monty Belmonte to bring to the community. Few people walk the walk as well as Monty does, but hardly anyone talks the walk about local food and farms as Monty does. So I'm so glad to share the stage and to hand it off to Monty Belmonte, our MC. Thank you, Phil. I would hug you, but we're still not there yet. COVID cooties. It's amazing to be back in this glorious theater, the Academy of Music. Today is the first time I've been in this theater in over a year, and when I walked in, I was overcome with emotion to see so many familiar faces that work behind the scenes, but just to be on this proscenium stage. I'm sorry you can't all be here with us today, but I'm imagining it like it's a farmer's field of corn in the early part of the season where it looks empty right now, but before you know it, this place is going to be filled with people talking your ears off and other corny jokes. This past year has been whatever cliche you'd like to insert for all of us. But one of the most amazing things that happened right when the pandemic hit in March of 2020 was how quickly our local agricultural community changed the way they do things to make sure that we in this valley and beyond would still have access to farm fresh food. And CESA played an amazing role in all of that. Looking back over the last year, I think of the Sunderland Farm Collaborative, a bunch of small farms getting together in the town of Sunderland, working together and figuring out how to deliver food up and down the valley safely to us when we needed that food and sustenance and comfort more than ever. Our restaurant community as well. There's almost nothing I love more than going out to eat and not having to cook. Our local restaurants turned on a dime, put up plastic sheeting and plexiglass, and moved towards takeout, even takeout cocktails, to give us that small sense of sanity while things were out of control. I think of Grow Food Northampton, who teamed up with the Northampton Survival Center and with community action of the Pioneer Valley to make sure that those who didn't know where their next meal would be coming from would know. 
the Northampton Survival Center was not the right kind of place for people to go to to access this food, so they created a whole new system on a dime to make sure that people had access to fresh local food that they needed. This is the kind of incredible community that we live in. These are the kind of stories that I love to share on my radio show each week, and these are the kind of stories that you're gonna hear tonight. You're gonna hear stories about how cultural divides have been bridged by the different cuisines of different cultures. You're gonna hear a story about a mall attack of the killer tomatoes. So many great stories that you'll hear tonight. And our first storyteller is the farm manager of Just Roots, Meryl Latronica. I've never been to an Amish barn raising, but I have seen the movie Witness more times than I can count. So I feel like I've been there. So picture me, I'm Harrison Ford uh, at my first barn raising, except that it's January, uh, it's Massachusetts. I'm 26 years young and I'm 20 feet up on a ladder overseeing the final touches of my very first greenhouse project. It's a greenhouse raising. Everybody ready, I say from the top of my perch. I look down to my right. There's my 55-year-old coworker, John, giving me a goofy look. We've only been working together five weeks, but he and I have this special connection and he, he lassos the plastic water bottle, string plastic combination above his head and I give him a goofy nod right back. I look to my left. There's my mom, of course, my farmer mentor, and my childhood friend who showed up for the day. Everybody's here. My farmer mentor says, hey, fama, are we doing this? I say, yeah, we're doing this. All right, everybody, let her rip. I watch as arms swing back and forth and back and forth and up and over and one after another, after another water bottle, string, plastic. The folks on the left grab the string and arm over arm, they start pulling and I'm standing there watching as the plastic crawls up one side of the greenhouse right to the peak above my eyes and then falls to the other side so gracefully touching the ground. Oh my gosh, there's a roof. Uh, this is amazing, everyone, I yell. I can't even stand it. Okay, Mom, a, a few steps back, yeah. And hey, John, just a few steps to, yeah, okay, yeah. All right, we got it, everybody. This is perfect. Let's fasten it up. I grabbed the wiggle wire, which is up on the ladder with me. And for those of you who don't know wiggle wire, please watch your eyes. I fasten the plastic to the metal frame, kind of moving my arms like this and that, and I watch the person across from me do the same, and we get down the ends, and we go across the sides, and we have a greenhouse. We have a greenhouse. Oh my gosh, trembling, I walk down the ladder step by step, and I step inside, inside a structure that I have helped to build. I'm filled with pride. My mom comes in and gives me a super nice hug and she says, good job, honey. And I say, thanks, mom. This is pretty cool, right? Everybody comes on in and we celebrate with the pizza and beer as you do and everybody's laughing and I'm feeling community and, and we're just full of possibilities of what this new farm is about to become. End of the day rolls around and I walk head up high back to my house. I live there on the farm. I couldn't be fuller. The next morning comes around, it's a blustery January day, and um, so I go to the NOFA Winter Conference, because that's what you do when you're 26 and you're learning to farm. I have a day full of connection and learning, and again, the high from the greenhouse raising and the high from community, it's like, I found this, I'm doing this, this is my job. I couldn't believe how lucky I felt. The day was ending, it was time to go home, and honestly, I could not wait to check on that greenhouse. So I turn down the farm road, I drive past the big, beautiful barn at the entrance, head up, I'm so excited to be home. I drive on a little bit, there's the piggery where the piglets will soon be born. And then, huh, John? Why is my coworker John here? It's evening on a Saturday, and what? is he looking at? 
I slowly roll the window down and I hear the howling wind and I know that something is very, very wrong. I step out of the car and I look up slowly and there where there had once been a beautiful brand new roof, there was a wild sail high in the sky. Flapping, 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 the sound of the plastic and the lumber and the nuts and bolts slamming on the metal structure, which was once so pristine. I stand there and I know there's nothing I can do. John appears next to me. He says, Meryl, I tried. I tried. I threw cinder blocks and rocks and lumber, and I tried to hold it down, but the wind, it was just too strong. It's okay. He heads home, and I walk back to my house, this time head hung low. I collapse in a puddle on my kitchen floor and stare at the ceiling. An hour goes by, a second hour, Next thing I know, it's the next morning. I've been there all night. I sit up. I stand up. I get my winter jacket on, and I head out to see the carnage. On the way back to that greenhouse, one more time, I call my friend, I call my mentor, I call my coworker. Can you guys meet me at the greenhouse? We have um, a situation. I gather up tall ladders and super sharp knives. We all meet up there and we start cutting and pulling and piling up that beautiful roof on the side of the greenhouse. There it is. There it was. Two weeks later, I'm back up on that ladder. Everybody ready, I say. And we start again. That was 15 years ago. And you know what? That greenhouse is still standing. And me, I'm still farming. And the thing I've learned is that things fall apart, sometimes slowly and softly, sometimes loudly and wildly and out of your control. But you go and you pick up the pieces, you save the pieces that aren't broken, and you get back to work. Thank you. When I was a kid, I believed that there were two different types of food, Italian food and Italian-American food. But once in a while, we got Chinese food, and it always blew my mind. It's amazing how the cuisines of different cultures can bridge the divides of different cultures. And here to tell us a story about that is Northampton-based psychologist, Ai Ling Han. So much depends on where you come from. This was in the early 1970s, and I was a young teen, and my family had just come here from Indonesia. We moved from a city of a million people to a town so tiny that it only had one barber shop, one general store, one bar. It also only had one post office where everyone had to go in to pick up their mail. When you enter, a gregarious postmaster greeted you and held court for as long as you give him the time. A few months after we moved here, the postmaster invited my family over for dinner. We were most excited and very, very curious. He and his wife greeted us with open arms and gave us a tour of their house. The room I remember the most is their dining room. It had a long, beautiful wooden table, very comfortable looking high back chairs, warm colored walls, and a built-in cabinet with their beautiful china. That room looked very inviting. At some point, they took us outside to their backyard and the postmaster walked straight to, the, to a large metallic pole 
and poured in some gasoline before he lit a fire. After a while, his wife brought out a tray with round pieces of flat raw meat that had shiny square pieces of white paper in between. He invited us to, uh, to stand around the black bowl while he put the meat in neat rows over the fire. I looked closely at those meats. I saw no seasoning or spices whatsoever. It was not a promising start. She brought out another tray. It had bread, uh, pieces of uh, lettuce, and slices of tomatoes and onions. Those were familiar. There were also a jar with unnaturally yellow li colored liquid and another jar with shiny blood. <laughs> she turned to us and she said, please help yourselves. All six of us looked at her as if she was an alien from Mars. Noting our confusion, she quickly gave each of us a plate. More confusion. These plates were made of paper, and they were very flimsy. Why wouldn't they let us use real plates, I thought. You know, like the China, their China. And we are dressed in our Sunday best. Why are we here outside under the heat of the summer sun? Instead of inside, in that beautiful dining room of theirs. I was thinking, like a young teen, looking at my parents with, uh, with accusing eyes. Didn't we sacrifice a lot to come here, the land of uh, milk and honey? His wife was showing us how to put, what to do. First the bread, then the vegetables, then the round piece of meat, and then top it with blobs of that yellow and bloody sauce. We followed suit and, made, and put together our first American sandwich. I looked at my parents' plates, I felt sorry for them. I looked down at my own plate. I felt sorry for all of us. We had no choice. We had to pick up our sandwich, which I did like it was a hot potato. I'll always remember my first bite. Looking back, I know it was a hamburger, 80-20 ground chuck to be precise. Wow, I thought. I slow down my eating, noticing the crispness and the freshness of the vegetables, marveling at the sweetness and the tartness of the sauces, and just savoring, really savoring, the smokiness and the juiciness of the meat. It was so good, I couldn't believe it. With one bite, that postmaster catapulted me into hamburger heaven. My fate was sealed. I looked at my parents and I thought, damn, they made the right decision, moving to the U.S. Now, decades later, this immigrant loves nothing more than to invite our American-born friends to our backyard and taking them on a tour to that hamburger heaven that the U.S. postmaster first introduced me to. Thank you. Hamburgers fall under the category of Italian-American food, depending on the toppings. And it was not something that I learned how to cook. My dad, who is the Italian-American in the family, almost never cooked except hamburgers. My mom, who's Irish, learned how to cook Italian and taught me very little. But luckily, I spent an awful lot of time with my grandmother, Nana, who taught me everything she knew before she died. Learning about cooking can be so important. Or not. 
my children also have grown up picking kale out of the garden and referring to it as lollipops because it's a long stem with something you eat on top. So things through kids' eyes can be remarkable. And here to talk about farming through kids' eyes is Jake Crane. Have you ever had to herd 30 sheep and 30 children at the same time? Because I have. But let me explain a little bit. I work at Redgate Farm. We are an educational farm, which means I have the wonderful job of getting to farm with children. And there are some amazing things that come out of that. They build self-confidence, they learn about teamwork, they connect with nature. And one of the many things that kids do with us on the farm is taking care of our livestock, which includes sheep. So this one summer, we were moving our sheep from one pasture to the other. And it just so happened that this field was really far away from their current location. I'm talking down a hill, behind a barn, around a corner, up our driveway, across the road to the new pasture. So I sit down to make my plan. And something you should know about me, I love planning. If every minute of my day was known and scheduled, that's a good day. So I sit down to make my plan, and I'm struck with the most brilliant idea. I got it. I will have the whole camp, all 30 kids and six counselors, move the sheep with me. What could go wrong? So I gather everyone together. All right, guys, today we're going to move the sheep. But before we do, I need to teach you a few things. Can anyone tell me, are sheep predators or are they prey? They're prey. Great. So what does that mean? Well, it's okay, I'll explain. It means that if you go towards a sheep, most likely they're gonna go in the opposite direction because they think you might be hunting them. We'll use that to our advantage today to get them to where we wanna go. But some of our sheep are curious, and if they come up to you, there's a simple trick. You can clap your hands and stomp your feet and go, yah, yah, yah. Can you do that? The kids do it back to me. Yah, yah, yah. Perfect. Now, we're also going to be creating a human fence along the whole route. So you're going to put your arms out wide, your feet out wide. You're going to be nice, tall, and confident. And the kids do that back. Great. So we've got our yawing, we've got our fence, we're ready. So the whole camp, all 30 kids line up. I take a smaller group with me, they go with a counselor, and they go behind the sheep to push. And I'm in the front with a bucket of grain. And I start to shake. The sheep notice me, and they start running. So I start running, and I'm shaking my grain, and I'm running by these kids. I'm like an Olympic runner holding my torch. And I make it all the way to the pasture. And I turn around, and it is chaos. Instead of crossing the road, the sheep have escaped, and they've gone up the road towards our neighbor's orchard. And the kids, knowing that that's not where the sheep should have gone, are running after them, doing the one thing I taught them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a cacophony of sound. The sheep are buying, the kids are yawing. I've got counselors running after kids who are running after the sheep. So we think fast, and another staffer runs up the road as fast as he can and gets ahead of the sheep. In a panic, the sheep turn around, noticing the nice, quiet, green pasture they were supposed to go to all along. As soon as the last sheep gets into the pasture, I close the gate as fast as I can. Whew. Inside, I am furious at myself for planning such a terrible project. And I'm already thinking about how I'm going to tell the kids that 
everything's okay, super fine and happy. And as I go to turn to them, I realize the kids are elated. They are grinning from ear to ear. That was the best project ever. I can't wait to tell my mom I heard sheep. And they were, awesome. they were right. It was awesome. And I realized, yeah, the planner in me was not happy. That did not go well. But the farmer in me was quite amused because those kids really were farming. I don't know a farmer that hasn't had an animal escape or a storm come in quickly and you've got to act quickly. And the educator in me was really satisfied because those kids had a very memorable experience and they did learn something. And when they go home and they find themselves in a situation that changes on them all of a sudden, they're gonna be okay. They're gonna think to themselves, I got this. It's just like herding sheep. Thank you. Field Notes Seconds are true stories from the fields of Western Mass that didn't quite make the cut for the Field Notes program. These one to two minute stories are just like seconds in the field. They're still great stories, but they just didn't make the final cut. It was my very first year farming. It was August and the tomatoes were just rolling in when I learned that my grandmother was going to die. She had decided to take herself off of dialysis and we had about two weeks left with her. So every day after my farm shift, I would drive a few towns over to spend time with her and my family. We would celebrate her and cheers her or we would sit quietly until she passed. A year later, I was on a new farm. It was August, we were right in the tomato season, and I was helping my boss restring up some really healthy, beautiful uh, tomatoes that were just about to ripen. I kind of had my back up against the row um, to try to hold them up while she was stringing them. And as I was bent over, I, I just, I took a deep breath and, Grandma? I stepped out and the tomatoes fell behind me. Grandma, it was like she was there. All I could smell was just a deep grandma hug. Of course, my tiny Italian grandmother came and visited me in the tomatoes. It was a year to the day since she had passed. And every August since then, she comes and visits me in the tomatoes. Thank you. So, Monty, 10 years, 10 years. A decade. Of both of our lives. Yeah, wasted. Uh, no, we never oh, did drugs. Right, no. no. Because it usually... We have drunk. Yes, we have, and yeah. we have feasted. And we've feasted. On the local foods. Yes. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, for 10 years, Phil Corman has been coming into the radio station. Let's say nine years he's been coming into the radio <laughs> station, bringing a local farmer or restaurateur and introducing them to me and to our radio audience. The last year, it's been a little different. It's been a years-long Skype headache. Yes. And I can't wait until we can get back to being together. Yeah, and every time I am bringing something with me, might be food or something like that, or bringing, and bringing the guest who is a farmer or a restaurateur, I always have in the back of my mind, how can I surprise Monty this week? Yes, I love it. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, Monty, like, are there any surprises over the last 10 years that stick out for you? Do you mean something that you actually brought for us to consume, like tomato bugs or stories that we've heard? Uh, let, let's go with the stories first, perhaps. The story that surprised me the most was when there was an alpaca farmer who came in to tell us that he used to, um, let's just say, be a corporate hack. 
And I had asked what corporation he worked for, and he said, Frito-Lay. And I said, did you invent the Doritos? And he said, yes. And it blew my mind. He was a, a little bit more demure about it. His wife was like, he did. Don't let him tell you he didn't. The, he, yeah, the Cool Ranch he did. Cool Ranch, he yeah. tenderized the Fritos. Yeah. I mean, he, just on and on and on. What we need is local hero Doritos. And that would anybody, definitely... Anybody in the farming community, local hero Doritos is what we need. <laughs> that was one of the most fun ones. That, that definitely we, was. That was be, so surprising. Because this person, the, the couple had started in Texas, and it was his second career. Yeah. But... We always carry our former work with us. Right. I was also surprised when um, the, the esteemed Hadley asparagus farmer, Wally Sikowski, continued to pronounce the word asparagus, asparagus, over and over and over again. And I thought, wow, like this is a, a, like a local Western Mass colloquialism that I'm not familiar with. Like how so many people in Western Mass end their sentences with, hey, hey. You know, like they'll be like, oh, Phil Corman from CISA, hey. I was, when I learned about that, I thought, that's amazing. I love those little idiosyncrasies. And, Wally Sikowski kept calling it asparagus, asparagus. And I thought, wow, I'm going to start calling it that. I talked to his literal family members at an asparagus event in Hadley. And I said, do you guys all call it asparagus too? And they're like, no, only Wally calls it asparagus. And we did ask Wally about it. And do you remember what he said? He said, I don't know how I'm saying it any different than the way you're <laughs> saying it. <laughs> so I call it asparagus still for fun. And we've had some, I think, really interesting special moments when we had Ibrahim Ali come on in 2013. Yeah. And, you know, now people are talking about food and justice, but Ibrahim at Gardening the Community back then, that was front and center to all the work that was done there, and he was sharing that with us. And then oftentimes, Monty, something, we had learned something about a person during those short little interviews, and we learned that he was a hip hop artist. Yeah. That was incredible. The, and the amazing thing about Ibrahim and gardening the community is that the, over the course of the 10 years, this ridiculous publicity stunt I do for the Food Bank of Western Mass, where I push a shopping cart a ridiculous length of mile to raise money for the Food Bank, expanded from just Northampton to Greenfield to Springfield to Northampton, and then Northampton to Greenfield over two days. And gardening the community is in the neighborhood where we now start the March for the Food Bank, Mason Square, in Springfield. So we've seen it evolve from kind of this beginning right. of an idea to me being able to go down there for this publicity stunt to seeing the beautiful farm stand that then they that created to alleviate the food desert that exists in Mason Square. And all the while, this guy, Phil Corman from CISA, is my wingman at the front of the cart, pulling me up the hills to help get us there and to make sure that our neighbors have enough to eat while explaining the stories about how our farm community is there to make sure our neighbors have enough to eat. And then I think about the range of people we've had. Um, we've had farmers who have been farming in their family since 1760. Yeah. And we've had people who started their orchard in 2017. That range has been amazing. It's incredible. And uh, what I take from uh, a couple of those farmers who started, you know, their families way back when, is there's still um, that trust in the community where one farmer, I think it was Boyden Brothers Farm, which does amazing maple syrup and Christmas trees. Right. And basically, you go, you pay for your Christmas tree, no one's there. You just go and get it yourself, and it's just sitting out there. And do you remember what he said? I think one of us said, well, how do you know that they're going to pay for it? He said, well, if they need the tree and they can't pay for it, I want them to have it. And so they, that's what happened. It's, it's an incredibly trust. generous community in so many different ways. It does also remind me of that time that there was a pumpkin farmer who was <laughs> here at Field Notes, I think the first year, who was trying to capture the pumpkin thieves in his pumpkin patch. Doesn't mean you should go steal from farmers, but they are generous people by and large. They may take the keys out of your car while you're stealing a pumpkin and throw it into the patch so that you can't get back into your car, just be aware. And maybe last, I do think of the orchardist, um, uh, Phoenix Fruit Farm, which um, Ellie Vaughn started her orchard there, and she probably at that time in 2017 might have been the first woman orchardist in New England, perhaps. 
And uh, she started the segment with us saying, like, there are so many trees in this orchard, because it had been an orchard before, but not well kept up. And she said, so many of these trees are way older than me. And when I'm planting new trees, I am thinking decades ahead and a certain sacredness about that. Quite beautiful. It's an amazing place that we live, and we're really lucky to hear these stories. You're really lucky that CESA exists to help these farmers and to get their stories out there. Sometimes the one thing I'd like to say to all those generational farmers whose farms started pre the US experiment is write down your stories. I want to hear what it was like way back then. And this, this event, the chronicling of this event, the filming of this event is a way that these stories will be shared, hopefully for generations to come. Great. Thank you all. Living in the valley, this agricultural community, I've experienced a lot of different foods that I wouldn't have normally tried. Kale, which I've grown to love. Kohlrabi, which I still think is something from an alien planet. But perhaps the culinary adventure of this story is a bridge too far, even for me. Please welcome Mariana Lacusa. Click, click, click. I heard a familiar yet terrifying sound coming from the tomato plants. <sighs> oh, God, no. They're here. It was a hot, late July day in the tomato high tunnel, and I began searching through the dense jungle of tomato vines. I knew they were here. I felt their presence. And sure enough, there was the defoliated plants, and there was a fat, green, horned, three-inch long spawn of Satan. The Shrek finger look-alike that is the bane of every self-respecting tomato grower. I'm talking, of course, about the tomato hornworm. After this crisis, my plans for the morning went on hold, because I knew where there was one, there were definitely more. And sure enough, like some perverse version of I Spy, I began to see them everywhere. It was a full-on greenhouse assault. So I plucked myself up, and I went to the barn to choose my weapon. And I came back brandishing an empty Gatorade bottle from the recycling bin. And with that, I began harvesting my foe. I picked what felt like thousands until I finally ran out of water bottles from the recycling. And in July especially, farmers drink a lot of water, so there is no shortage of water bottles, okay? Yeah, after that, it felt like a good time to stop for lunch. So I sat there, watching these writhing green sausages in their plastic prison, and suddenly my kale and pesto and avocado sandwich on a spinach wrap was just way too green. <sighs> After lunch, I had other things to attend to, so I left the hornworms trapped where they were. And I came back many hours later to find them baking alive in the sun. And most of them had stopped moving, and I felt really bad about it. And it was only then that I looked at them closely, maybe for the first time ever, and I realized how kind of pretty they are. They're this light spring green with little white stripes and all these dots on it that kind of look like eyeballs. They're really endearing in a kind of like ugly duckling way. And it was through no fault of their own there in my greenhouse. I mean, it's what they're supposed to do. I had to admire their audacity and their veracity because they will demolish a greenhouse in just a couple days. It's amazing. It really is. So even though I still cringed every time I walked by the high tunnel, it was with an undertone of pity. And not to worry, I was back in that greenhouse just a few days later. And as I walked down the aisles, I felt and heard a squish. I looked under my boot, and I found a squish green tomato. But it wasn't a tomato. It was a hornworm. And it's funny how like, kind of similar they look. And maybe it was the hot sun, 
or low blood sugar, but at that moment, I felt a feeling never before inspired by a bug. Hunger. <laughs> After that, I began researching hornworms in my spare time. Turns out, not the only one who's ever thought about eating bugs. And uh, I found forums, appreciation pages, even recipes. So one fine summer evening, I left work at the farm with half a dozen green tomatoes and a bottle of fresh hornworms. In my kitchen, I took those Shrek finger lookalikes. I coated them in cornmeal, fried them up to a nice crisp golden brown, paired them with some green tomatoes, a little roasted red pepper, just a dash of Parmesan, and I took a bite. And it was crunchy on the outside and kind of squishy, chewy on the inside. And that first one just tasted like a worm, as I expected. But the second one tasted like a fried green tomato with just a hint of basil. Wow. By that third one, I needed no convincing. I was sold on it. And I had the realization that the only thing that had kept me back from eating and enjoying bugs my entire life was the yuck factor. I mean, once you get past the like little wiggly bits in the eyes, they ain't half bad. And of course they tasted like tomatoes. I mean, hornworms spend their entire lives just chowing down on tomato plants. And after all, we are what we eat. So there's that. Anyhow, even though insects and hornworms haven't exactly become a staple part of my diet, and if you come over to my house for dinner, I probably won't serve them to you unless you ask, I sure don't mind finding them on my tomato plants these days. Yum. Thank you. I used to be terrified of mushrooms. And I knew that my mom only used mushrooms in spaghetti. And she would put them in a blender to hide them so that uh, I don't see them. And as soon as we eat spaghetti, all I needed to look for was something gray. And then I just get out of the, dining, uh, of the table. So this is what happened. When I was about eight, uh, ten of us, uh, childhood friends, went to the movie. We thought it was going to be an adventure, and it was about ten sailors who got stranded on an island after a storm. And there was no life in this island, and except for this one beautiful plant, and they were mushrooms. And they tried them, and it was delicious. So they just kept eating the mushrooms, because really that was all they could survive on. After a while, they noticed a little kind of small uh, pinprick dot. And then over time, the dot became a little spot. And then over time again, it started sprouting, growing out. And then it became, you know, a little longer than half an inch. And it kept growing and it kept growing. And at some point, it became little mushrooms. Over time, it's all over the body. Over time, a big, huge, bulbous mushroom grew out of their head. And as soon as that mushroom matured, they began chasing each other to eat each other. So there was no way I was ever going to eat mushrooms. When I was a senior in college, I had a roommate named Linda. She ate every night three things, carrots, celery, and mushrooms. And I would like go to the corner of my bed and just look at her very carefully. When we graduated, we decided to celebrate with our friends to go to a, and went to a restaurant. And one of the choices was a salad, and it said mushroom. I decided to give it a try. I said, what the heck? She hasn't grown anything over her head, on her head. So I did. 
It didn't taste bad. But for the next 12 months, every day, I very carefully looked all over my body to see if there are going to be anything growing. And as you can see, nothing happened. <laughs> Thank you. Please welcome to Field Notes, Sarah Rivers. We're sipping our bourbon, listening to our favorite playlist as we prep the kitchen to create a beautiful meal together. It's date night. The next thing I know, the sirens are blaring, skillet popping angrily at me. I'm caught standing in front of the stove, two flimsy pieces of haddock in front of me. The fish are burning, do something now. Wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to take you back in time so you can understand the depth of this emergency situation. I grew up poor. My family moved from one apartment to the next in a tiny uh, working class city in Western Mass. No matter where we lived though, one thing was constant. My dad always had a vegetable garden and my mom made everything from scratch. Every day when my dad got home from work, we'd marvel at the snap peas sprouting off the long green stalks and bring in the day's ripened vegetables. Then I'd help my mom make dinner, stirring basil into homemade marinara or dropping dumplings into a simmering pot. The dinner table was the hub of our tiny apartment, the place where we shared stories while we ate homemade minestrone. Naturally, I thought when I grew up, I'd magically acquire my dad's green thumb and my mother's stellar cooking skills. To my surprise, I killed every plant I owned and I burned everything I cooked, even water. My mother always joked we'd never be homeless because I could just make a house out of brownie bricks. But still, that dinner table was so important to me, so it remained the hub of my adult life. It just held more paper plates and takeout than the home-cooked meals I grew up with. After I got divorced and then failed at dating for years on end, I swear it wasn't my cooking, I don't think. I met someone that I wanted to share home-cooked meals with at our dinner table. So on date number five, I invited Mike over for supper. My sister said, what could he have possibly done already for you to want to kill him? Grateful for friends who knew how to make an easy meal, I was able to throw a pot roast in a crock pot and simmer it in a bottle of red wine for eight hours. Voila, dinner was a smashing success. For the months that followed, Mike wooed me, taking me to every cuisine in Northampton, Japanese, Thai, Greek, you name it, we tried it. And we discovered that we had a love for food and travel. So for the months that followed after that, we traveled everywhere to try new cuisine, both near and far. Then the pandemic hit. We quarantined together and once again brought our food adventures back into the kitchen. That's when Mike confessed that that first night I cooked for him, he noticed my empty fridge, save for some condiments, a beer, and a withered orange. That's why you bought me a cookbook, I asked. I bought us a cookbook. Stuck in the house with no, nothing to do, we dove into that cookbook like it was the hottest new trend. While Mike taught me the right temperatures and time to cook everything, I taught him how to choose higher quality produce and meats. And soon we learned, as our cooking skills strengthened, that most of our cooking fails were a result of subpar cookware. So we bought brand new knives, pans, and pots. Why have I never bought a wok before? I exclaimed as we enjoyed stir fry that we had just made in mere minutes. I soon realized that our cooking together mirrored our relationship. Mike was the ever calm, supportive sous chef who let me take charge. It's chicken chowder night. Get the ingredients. Chop that broccoli into one inch cubes. I'll dry rub the chicken. But don't get him wrong, Mike could take charge too. 
Here's a cup of coffee, Sarah. I'm making you a big breakfast. We learned how to work closely together, careful to not get in each other's way as we flitted about the kitchen. It was like a dance. We learned how to share responsibility, how to ask for help, and then accept that help. And we also learned that no matter what tragedies happened, and there were a lot this past year, we could depend on each other to provide comfort in food and in life. I went from brownie bricklayer to amateur chef in no time, and my cockiness was a little too much. I sauntered up to that fish counter on date night and ordered a pound and a half, a pound and a half of wild caught haddock. I had never cooked haddock before, and I was prepping my kitchen as if I was about to make salmon. So when the siren started blaring, I did too. They're burning! They're burning! Grab the tongs! Do something! Mike started hopping, darting, skipping, until all was calm again. I turned to him in complete embarrassment. That wasn't my finest hour. Well, now we know how it comes in five pieces, not two, Mike said. I thought about my dad's phenomenal garden and my mom's cooking that made any celebrity chef to shame. And I realized they did everything separately. My mom alone in her kitchen, my dad alone in his garden, and their marriage failed. Mike and I do everything together. And whether it's a burning fish or a death in the family, we lead or support when the other one needs it most. And that is what makes the best recipe. Thank you. I know the pandemic has been weird for everybody and sometimes you look out there and you think, do I live in a post-apocalyptic hellscape? But even before the post-apocalyptic hellscape, a local mall was attacked by killer tomatoes, and it has nothing to do with the pandemic. Please welcome to Field Notes, Kathleen O'Keefe. Before the corona pandemic shut us all down, or after, I should say, all I wanted to do was to throw a party. I'm a farmer, a winter market manager, and before the shutdown, I used to work behind the scenes on this very stage. I love farming, it's incredibly grounding, but I missed the excitement and energy that comes with the lights and the sound and the roar of the crowd. And so I weeded carrots, ho-hum. I moved chicken tractors, ho-hum. I harvested vegetables, ho-hum. And as the seasons changed from the summer to the fall, my mind started wondering, how are we gonna put on this winter market? All we had been hearing was how bad it was going to be and how corona cases were going to spike. And so I submitted my plan to the Board of Health with six feet of social distancing, masks, and half the vendors, and we got approved. Two weeks before our opening date, December 5th, I got an email from the Board of Health. Sure enough, corona cases had spiked, our plan had been revoked, we needed an alternative. So fortunately, the general manager of the mall and I had come up with plans A, B, C, and D, and so we executed plan C. We were gonna move from our former hallway into what was an indoor go-kart arena with 8,000 square feet of space. And so we opened our doors to very happy customers and plenty of social distancing. And these customers were so thankful that we had taken the time and energy to put on this market because they too were desperate for that community that we had all lost. And I was glad for that. I was thankful to hear their appreciation, but I was still dying for that party. And so towards the end of market, in the middle of February, one of my newest vendors came up to me and said, Kathleen, ever since I was a little girl, I used to save my pennies for this festival in Lithuania called Kozuki Muj. Can we have it here? And I said, yes, yes, we can. What is Kazuki Muj? 
And she told me it was a festival that celebrated St. Casimir and the coming of spring, and I couldn't have been ex more excited to do this for her. And so I went home and I put on my party planning hat and thinking of all the things you need for a good party, food, music, decorations, and oh right, it's still a pandemic. We can't have food because no one can eat inside. We can't have people gathering because we still have capacity limits. But maybe we can still decorate. And so I looked up what Kazuki Muge was. And if you can imagine Mardi Gras without the sex and alcohol, then you have it. Thousands of people in the streets there to celebrate intricate wooden crafts and pastries and these beautiful flowers that are dyed in bright pinks and blues and purples. And so I thought, that's our inn. But how am I gonna make these paper flowers? Or how am I gonna make these flowers come to life? And so I asked to the great goddess of crafts for inspiration. And yes, Martha Stewart, she answered. And so it turns out you can make paper flowers out of anything. You can make them out of paper bags, six paper bags, put them together, fold them back, bam, you've got paper flowers. Eight pieces of tissue paper, accordion style, little twist tie, bam, even bigger paper flowers. And so I spent weeks with making these paper flowers and people got involved making paper flowers and People donated tissue paper for paper flowers, and we packed my car with more de decorations than you can imagine. And so market day came, and I'm up on a four-foot ladder, hanging these flowers, and one of my older vendor came up to me and said, well, what's all this for? And I said, for Kazuki Muge. And he said, well, you must have known her for a long time to put all this effort into this. I said, no, just met this year. Well, why would you do this for her? Because she asked. And he walked away a little perplexed, and in comes Tiny Mila. I can see her scurrying across the floor. And she came up to me, and she was so excited. And there was so much energy in her face. And I couldn't concentrate on what she was saying. I'm up on this ladder looking down at her, trying to figure out what she was saying. And all these words were coming out. And I realized, oh, what a beautiful smile she has. And I'd never actually seen her face before. And at that moment, she went like this, oh, oh, I forgot to put on my mask. And I knew at that moment that we had succeeded in bringing her this tiny slice of home that she had needed. And she gave me that party that I was dying for. Wow, those stories were just so heartfelt. It was so great to hear the slices of the lives of our storytellers. That was Thank just you. so good. Thank you so much. And you know, I feel like there was a common thread through all these stories, which was local food and local farms and the land beneath our feet really is central to our communities and culture. I want to thank Max Wareham, our perennial banjo player, who really makes this flavor of the event come through. I want to thank Monty Belmonte. Monty, I will always pull your shopping cart whenever you commit to walk 43 miles to end hunger. And behind the scenes, Andrea Levitt, who managed to just coach so beautifully all the storytellers, and of course, my coworker, CISA staffer, Jacob Nelson, who was the wizard behind the curtain, who carried the details beginning, middle to end to allow this event to come to fruition. So over the years at CISA, we've had successes, but I have to be honest, really we could not do it without you. You've shared your critiques of our work, your feedback, your enthusiasm, your skills, your time, your financial support. And thanks to all of that, every year we've been able to help hundreds of farms and to ensure that a slice of the summer harvest is brought and given 
to many, many hundreds, over 500 low-income seniors. So I do want people to think about one thing who are listening tonight, and that is some of these storytellers, they got inspired to share their story because they had heard field notes in the past. So let me make this a seed I'm planting, a personal invitation to all of you, that if you feel a story bubble up for you, let it come out. And we would love to hear your story, and maybe in a year or two or three, you may find yourself gracing this stage. And for everybody else, we hope that we're there when you need something, whether it's what are the hours of the farmer's market, what great restaurant you want to try that's sourcing from local farms, what government policy needs to change. We'll be there for you every day at buylocalfood.org. And I hope next year I get to see all of you in person. Be safe and thank you. That is a wrap. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.